This is Buffalo's Uncensored Sports Show. You're watching Buffalo After Dark. Welcome to Buffalo After Dark, everybody. It is Wednesday night, November 29th. And of course, you got the both of us here. And Bob actually survived being in the Eagle's Nest down in Philadelphia. So how was it? Oh, my God. Uh, first off, I just want to give a quick shout out to Trevor because he's like, I hope Bobby survives Philadelphia. Otherwise, we'll never see Buffalo After Dark again. Uh, that, that's number one. Number two, I got to tell you, even though it was only a four day trip, I had a lot of fun. There was a lot to do in Philadelphia. And uh, I'm going to get more into that later. But let me tell you, it was quite the experience. Yeah, definitely. And I know you had some uh, stories you were telling me off air just before we went live here about uh, some of the fans and a little bit about the some antics that you saw and different things. So, of course, we can get into that as we go throughout the show. But yeah, but I'm like, oh, my God, with like a few of the things. Oh, yeah. And I also going to be doing a little show and tell. I know it's going to be hard for the viewers on Spotify to see it, but I'll explain it as we go through it. Yep. Definitely. But what we'll do, I know we started off a few minutes late, but we'll get right into it. So if you want to join us, uh, we have the Facebook chat up and running. And of course, you can give us a call 929-205-6099. So the Bills and the Eagles, you were there in person getting drenched on the entire game because it decided to just uh, the heavens decided to open up. But unfortunately, it was too little too late because the Bills apparently can't figure out fucking clock management, decide to kneel down with 20 seconds, and they get torched in the end zone by deciding to let Jalen Hurts be wide-ass open so he could run on a design play. So, of course, as a result, we lose 37 to 34 in overtime. At least it's against an NFC team, so it doesn't hurt us in the standings, and currently we are a half game back um, with the playoffs, but that loss drops us down to 10th in the AFC. And even worse, the Pittsburgh Steelers are ahead of us. You know what's funny is that, yes, you are correct. I obviously went to the game on the weekend in Philadelphia, and it was a hell of an experience. But as regarding to the game, uh, I will say this. Josh Allen probably played one of the best games we've probably seen him play in a while. And I think, he, if I remember correctly, he had almost 400 passing yards in total just from that game because of the fact that it went into overtime, mm-hmm. which you got to give a lot of props to the Bills. They went toe-to-toe with one of the best teams in football, mm-hmm. if not the best team in yeah, football. Yeah, had them down by 10 However, at time. But what ruined it, was the obvious, you know, refs, you know, I'm not going to blame the refs in every situation, but there was some moments throughout the game, which I felt was a complete, you know, bogus bullshit call. For Mm -hmm. example, the horse collar penalty. Oh, yeah, with the ripped jersey. Oh, yeah. And then Jason Kelsey went on WIP, 94 WIP in Philadelphia, which is their sports radio show, Mm -hmm. and had the audacity to say that Jordan Phillips should be fine for stepping off sides and hitting him in the head. Why? Because that's how fucking stupid and arrogant the Kelseys have become. And Jason Kelsey, I thought, was going to be likable, and yet he only made the situation worse for himself. So basically, I'll read you the caption very quick. He mm-hmm. said, quote, that Jordan Phillips purposely tried to hurt offensive lineman Cam Jurgens, and Kelsey said all this, by the way. He said, and I thought it should have been a personal foul. I thought that play in particular was absolutely a disgrace that the NFL should not allow, and I think he rightfully deserves to be fined. Those refs deserve to be fined with how they ended up calling some of that stuff because just like you mentioned, that horse collar, which turned into the 15-yard intentional grounding, that was a bullshit call. You know how I know they were trying to rig the game? The fumble in the last in the fourth quarter with Jalen Hurts. Mm-hmm. And they and they said that it was um I figured what exactly what they said, because obviously the broadcast would say it, and obviously I was there. So the perspective was a little different. But I remember watching that fumble and I'm like, that's totally a fumble. And then yet Eagles fans were throwing a fit at the game and they were like oh that's a forward pass oh how the fuck is that legal you know thing typical football shit when you're drunk right so i gotta tell you you know there were a lot of people on both sides the honest eagles fans were like yeah that game was rigged but then of course you have the deniers and they're saying no that game wasn't rigged they played a clean game and sean hockey lee had the audacity as well to say they they probably you know, refed one of the cleanest games in their careers. Like, 
You have to be a complete fucking liar. Oh, that was not a clean game. <laughs> no, it was not. And That's the problem is, is, yeah, and if anybody knows anything about the rules or anything about the game, it was very abundantly clear that they were trying to rig the game in favor of the Eagles. I don't care if I was there live, and I don't care if that's probably a nominee for Game of the Year. What killed it was that the officiating has been atrocious this year Mm -hmm. to the point where Jordan Poyer even called out the refs and said that they need to be held accountable for their actions. Well, it's true. Of course, heaven forbid you call out a ref and you get fined by the NFL. Maybe NFL. Maybe you should start holding your refs accountable. The good thing is, NFL, you can't find us. <laughs> We're our own show and we don't belong to you. So we could talk crap about the refs all we want. But yeah, but that was literally there were so many calls that should have either been a non call or so many calls that were a non call that should have been a call. That horse collar absolutely should have been one. That fumble, which turned out to be a forward pass, that should have been one. There are at least three or four critical calls that we can go back onto with this game that really could have turned the tide either way. And the fact that the Philadelphia Eagles only had one penalty at one point, I'm like, what is going on here? Yeah, and the funny thing is, Brett and I were keeping count throughout the game. Like, how many penalties did the Eagles have in this whole game? And I think, I remember in the third quarter, I think Brett said at that point, the Eagles only got cold once. And then they were a little more mellow yeah. in the first half when that was at the point where the Bills were just outright dominating the Eagles. And mm-hmm. then the second half comes and they they collapse. I don't yeah. understand this whole narrative about the Bills. Say, oh, Josh Allen's the problem. Oh, they're not good enough. They're never going to Oh, no, anything. Allen kept them in it. He was balling out. I and, think anybody and would... offense was finally I... doing things that we've been wanting to see that Dorsey was holding us back on. Yeah, and I think people who said that Josh Allen was the problem and the reason why they lost, Josh Allen could only do so much for that team, and he is the only sole reason why the Bills were even in contention for this game. And Mm -hmm. does it hurt to lose? Yes, of course. But I I would much rather lose to a good team like the Eagles than losing in an embarrassing fashion like to, like, earlier this year, the Jets in week one. The Broncos. The Patriots. So uh-huh. it's like, how the fuck do you accommodate yourself? Like Cincinnati, I get it. Philadelphia, I get it. But those lower tier teams were inexcusable. This I can understand. And plus, again, take it to what it was worth. The Bills had the lead. And just like two years ago in that classic AFC divisional game against Kansas City, yep, that constant back and forth. That is what that game reminded me of. I felt like I was at a playoff game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it very much had that. And and I will say, Philadelphia, we know, is a top three team in this league. Kansas City is up there. San Francisco is up there, even though they've had their trouble this year. But we went toe-to-toe with arguably one of the absolute elite teams in this league, and we almost won. So there are some good things to look at it. And for Brady to be only in the second week as OC and being able to dominate the way that they did. And the fact that we actually had established a run game and we were using more of the run game versus a lot of the arm at certain points. It's good. I like that. We actually mixed it up and we actually got some usage in there. Um, Now here is one thing I will say, Gabe Davis, how the fuck do you not have, your head turned the opposite way to catch the ball for an easy seven. I was so ready to celebrate. And then he misses it. Allen had possession right there. That was not his fault. He was in the right position at that point to throw the ball to Gabe Davis, but Davis decided to not move his fucking legs. Right. And it's like, Gabe Davis, why? And, and the thing is, is Joe Brady threw himself under the bus for that play. It wasn't Joe Brady's fault. It wasn't Josh Allen's fault. It was Gabe Davis's fault because here he is. He screws up on a big play again. And he wonders why he's not a number one or number two wide receiver. Yeah. And get this into consideration. Joe Brady actually held himself accountable. That's something Dorsey never did. Oh yeah. Think about that. Yeah. Brady. And I said this earlier, a few weeks ago when he was fired, first hired as interim, 
He has experience in the job, in the collegiate level, with mm-hmm. Joe Burrow, with Jamar Chase, with Justin right. Jefferson. Good players. With, um, with CEH. You know, all these people played under Joe Brady. He knows their system. So to be the OC, which has so far been working pretty well. Yeah. But, well, I, I can't give the offense too much crap because they literally put up 34 points against the Philadelphia Eagles. Oh, yeah. And I was not even thinking it was going to be 30 on either side, literally. No. But the fact that it turned out to be more of a shootout game, I like, holy crap. So I will give Brady a lot of props because it seems like just in the first two weeks, he has fixed so much of the offense that we were lacking. And he's actually become a balanced offense, which is good. Oh, and by the way, trainers in the chat, he ends up saying, fly, Eagles, fly. (laughs) And you know what? He was there with me. (laughs) Yes, he was. So, trainer, buddy, I hope you're listening because you know where I'm going to get at next. Yep. And by the way, if anyone's wondering what I'm drinking, Buffalo Trace bourbon coffee. (laughs) So he brought home some Kentucky, some Kentucky bourbon with him in coffee. Actually, no, this is uh, a Keurig K-Cup, so it has bourbon and everything with it. Well, that's kind of what I'm saying, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's almost like the Cincinnati trip never left your mind. Right. <laughs> exactly. But but I will say, Brady, I think, even though he's only coached two games, I think he's been phenomenal. But mm-hmm. I want to see at least one more game out of him to yeah. f- make a full judgment because I'm not going to judge him based off of two games, but for what we've seen both in person and on TV, I think it's completely different from Ken Dorsey for the, like 80% of the season. Yeah, exactly. I would want to see how he matches up against the chiefs because that's the next big test. And literally the bills at this point, it's must win mode or you're done. Yeah. I think at this point, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this is a win-win situation throughout the rest of the season, and I'll explain why. I've said a few weeks ago that if the Bills miss the playoffs, they're going to fire McDermott. I, I'm remotely convinced they're going to do so. I even read a report from from Benjamin Albright, which I'm not really too keen on, but he specifically said that the Buffalo Bills are going to be looking into the head coaching uh, situation in the end of the year, and they're going to evaluate Sean McDermott. So I think if the Bills miss the playoffs, good. Get rid of his ass. He's done so much for the organization. He's a good coach. There's no question. But his leadership and his moral of the room, he's losing it. And there's been a lot of stories that have come out of that Eagles game that is pretty much showing his true colors. Yeah, and let's let's actually jump into that because um... – one of the things that I ended up having a chance to watch mo- on Monday night um, here locally in Buffalo, there's a show called Sports Talk Live, and Vic Carucci, an NFL insider, is on there with uh, WGRZ sports anchor Adam Panini. And that was one of the things that they were definitely talking about is McDermott on the hot seat. And Carucci is saying that the seat is definitely getting hotter because he compared this game to the 13 seconds. He also compared it to some of the clock management previously and some of the other plays that we've actually talked about on the show in the past and one of the things that he thought about there's a couple of scenarios that could happen if they were to go ahead and replace him his thought process is who do you get at this point do you get an up-and-coming coordinator who's never been a coach do you try to go with Harbaugh which who knows what'll happen now their thought process is right now we don't necessarily fire McDermott but we have to reevaluate a lot of different things. And the thing that Carucci thought, and this was kind of interesting, if McDermott goes, then Brandon Bean goes, then Joe Brady goes, and then basically you're rebuilding a lot of the coaching staff. That, that's one take that they had. But then again, at the other, at, on the other side of things, you know, Brandon Bean has not been horrible with drafting. He's been no. very good with the salary cap and he's been able to restructure a lot of deals to free up money, which is always good. And let's look at what's happened overall. I mean, defensively, except for how we collapsed again in, in this game, defensively for the most part, that's what kept us in games when we had Dorsey as a coordinator. But I also think at the same time, if McDermott's going to stay, we have to get a full-time defensive coordinator. Just let McDermott just go back to being head coach. Let him focus on that. Get a top-tier defensive coordinator. 
let's, you know, considering I would say with Joe Brady, let's at least see what he does over the next couple of games because Kansas City is a big test that comes up. And literally the rest of the season, we have a big test. You have Kansas City in two weeks, and then you have the Dallas Cowboys right after that, which is arguably one of the top defenses in the league. And then, of course, you have the Chargers, the Patriots, and the Dolphins to round it out. So I would say Patriots, that's a must win. And if we lose that game, then I would say at that point, <laughs> McDermott's done. If we lose to them a second time, even if we lose to the Chargers, I think that he could potentially be done. You lose to the Miami Dolphins, could potentially be done. I would almost say for right now, just in the sake of keeping consistency, wait till the end of the season. But at the same time, we need to get a defensive coordinator. And honestly, I hope that they're already starting that search and looking at that. Brady, on the other hand, the offensive side of the ball, the last two weeks, he's made some great changes. Allen's finally being himself again. He's utilizing his tight ends more. He's utilizing the run game more. Love the fact that Murray and Cook have definitely been getting a lot more touches, which is absolutely essential, especially if we're going to make a playoff run. If we can write the ship, then okay. We have something to work off and we could be a potentially dangerous team. I'm just questioning though, why did we not? And I understand McDermott wanted to call the defense after, after Frazier decided to walk, but realistically should have gotten a D coordinator. Okay. So I have, a, that's a mouthful. So uh, yeah. I'm going to try to start from the top of this giant burger. Okay. From starting at the top one. So my first thought is this, I understand where courage is coming from. I do. However, I don't think firing bean is going to change anything because if you fire bean, you might potentially be bringing in somebody who has never either been a general manager or could fuck up the cap. We don't know. However, keeping Bean, I think, would be a really smart idea because of the fact that if you keep Bean, it's familiarity within the system. He knows because every single player that's on that team are all his players. You're not going to just jolt the team because you fired one guy. Mm -hmm. I do agree with, you know, bringing in a defensive coordinator, excuse me, like that needs to happen because McDermott, I feel like to me, the defense got a lot worse under McDermott than it was under Leslie Frazier. Like, yeah, it's easy to point the finger that at Leslie Frazier from the Cincinnati game from a year ago in the playoffs, but compare that to now McDermott has full control. And I said this as well, is that he sacrificed everybody from his staff from almost 10 years. Like Rick Dennison was gone. That we knew that that was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dable got a head coaching job. Dorsey just got fired. And then Leslie Frazier was just the D coordinator for after seven years. Like enough is enough. But who stays? The head coach. Because it's, it's a Pittsburgh Steelers mentality. Everybody else either resigns or retires or gets fired. And mm-hmm. the coach stays where he is. I think McDermott with the right, you know, staff, I think with the right pieces, he could be a Super Bowl contending coach. And it's not to take away his credibility because I think McDermott for being a first time head coach and he's been in the same spot for almost 10 years. I think he's done a hell of a job of getting the bills to be consistently good in the playoffs, but they can never get over the hump. And I think McDermott can only take them so far just based on what they've been able to do. So with that being said, yes, they need to get either an offensive minded coach. Cause I've said this for a while. I want Ben Johnson from the Detroit lions, but I find that hard to believe they're going to let him go. Right. But I'm also, I'm also not against the idea of bringing in Jim Harbaugh, but under one condition, if you keep Joe Brady in your staff, because if you fire Joe Brady, the Bills made a massive mistake, and I am telling you right now. Yeah, because Brady will go somewhere, and he'll get hired right away. Absolutely, even if it's an offensive coordinator job. Like, yeah, he was shit in Carolina, but that's the difference. Carolina does not have anybody. Yeah, and Dave Tepper is an idiot. <laughs> exactly. And then on top of all that, you go from Sam Darnold and Baker Mayfield to Josh Allen, which is a huge jump to most people's resumes. Mm-hmm. And being a conservative coach – doesn't get you Super Bowls. And the Bills, within the six, seven years that McDermott's been here, the closest they've gotten was 2020. So people need to realize that as much as of a, of a reputational coach as McDermott has been in Buffalo, 
You have to change course. McDermott has done only so much to get over the hump, Mm -hmm. and it's only his own damn fault for firing these coaches that have not worked out in his favor, having feuds with Brian Dable, and then firing Leslie Frazier and making him the scapegoat and Ken Dorsey being the scapegoat. Sean McDermott is the last one, and he absolutely knows that his job is on the line. He absolutely knows this. So if McDermott wants to stay, he needs to seriously consider getting a defensive-minded coach as defensive coordinator, stay as the head coach, and maybe keep Brady if he gets promoted to that job. Now, do I think the Pagulas will do it? It depends on the pressure. Because if people could get Ken Dorsey fired, I could see the same thing happening with, with McDermott. I, I seriously can. Right. Yeah, potentially could. And you know what? And it's, and it's interesting we're talking about this, and we'll jump into our next thing in just a moment, but – it reminds me of what Andy Reid went through as head coach in Philadelphia because he was there for so long. He was known to fire coordinators. Andy Reid made the mistake on the offensive side of the ball when he brought in Juan Castillo, who was only a high school coordinator, which basically tanked their offense. <laughs> and then there was problems. And of course, he got fired and he got brought into Kansas City. What happened when he went to Kansas City? Andy Reid finally got a Super Bowl. So sometimes, you know, change of scenery is not bad. Right, but and, Andy and Reid also had some really good minds behind him because he right. had Travis Kelsey for a handful of years before Mahomes. Mm-hmm. They were a playoff team, but they weren't Super Bowl until they got Patrick Mahomes. Right. It was kind of a similar situation to what we're facing now in terms of what we need to do. And uh, you don't want to hear this. The rags just went up one nothing on Detroit. <laughs> yeah, I, I have the game on, so it's all good. Yeah, yeah, but it's kind of a – I guess in a way it's a similar situation with what Andy Reid went through and, and – similar type of thing where a lot of people were wondering why did Philadelphia not get rid of Andy Reid sooner? It's kind of, we're almost seeing a similar situation here, I guess, to some extent. So it'll be interesting to see what plays out, but you know, time will tell, but at the very least, I mean, the hot seat is starting to turn up a little bit, but Carucci did give uh, McDermott a lot of credit though, for turning the bills around from where they were, which he absolutely deserves credit, you know, in a lot of ways, because he changes from basically a perennial losing stock to now our expectations are playoffs are better. And we've actually been able to rebuild and do so in a good way. So at least we've gotten to that point. Now it's just, we have to get that consistency. We have to be better on the defensive side of the ball, you know, especially in these types of situations, because Honestly, one of the things I was thinking when I was watching that game is they haven't had Jalen Hurts do too many design runs, but all he needed were those two plays to round out overtime, and that's exactly what happened. And they put constant pressure on Jalen Hurts in the first half, and I saw that in person, and I'm just like, yeah, Yeah. this is exactly – Why did they quit? (laughs) Like, this is exactly what they should have done to Russell Wilson. But then again, that's out of the picture. You can't change history. But I do think, though, if you really think about it, if you fire Sean McDermott, that would probably be the best thing that ever happened to the Bills because defensive minded coaches are starting to become like as bland as wet paper. Like it's starting to dry up in the NFL. Most teams now hire offensive minded coaches. Now, I think if McDermott were to be axed, and I think there's a very good chance that can happen, if he's axed, you know how many people would kill to have that Buffalo job? Oh, yeah. Just to coach Josh Allen? Yeah. And I would guarantee you Jim Harbaugh would love it because of the fact that, A, he wants to get back into the NFL. The Chicago Bears ain't doing shit. And the Chicago no. Bears want Harbaugh beyond belief to coach um, uh, to coach over there. And, and I can tell you, if you had a choice, if you're coming back into the NFL and you're a proven winning coach and you had a choice between the Chicago Bears or the Buffalo Bills, where your roster is virtually playoff and Super Bowl contender ready, guess what? You're going to the Bills. Right, but you also have to take into account with the Chicago Bears. They currently, right now, have a 66% chance to get the first overall pick, thanks to Carolina's incompetence, which we'll get to in a sec. But if you take Josh Allen and Caleb Williams, Caleb Williams is a question mark. We don't even know how good he's going to be yet. Josh Allen is bringing an established quarterback in the National Football League, and he's been like this for a few years. Did he start off like that? Absolutely not. But Mm -hmm. from what we've been able to see since 2020, his resume is good enough to lure a popular coach to come play in the NFL. And the Pagulas, I assure you, would be willing to try to get Jim Harbaugh to come back to the NFL and be the head coach of 
the Buffalo Bills. But I also would not mind having another coach, but I don't want just sexy big names. I want a coach who actually knows how to coach. I'm not talking about like, just for example, like the Andy Reeds. you know, the Andy Reeds a great coach, yes. but he has a good system or someone like that. You know what I mean? Like an offensive minded coach. Do not bring in Ron Rivera. That's a defensive minded coach. Ooh, Get him out yeah. of there. I don't want yeah, Ron Rivera. And he's likely getting the ax at the end of the season from everything that's coming out of Washington right now. So now as a D again, coordinator, not a bad option. Oh, absolutely. If Ron Rivera were to be the Bills defensive coordinator, I would totally take that. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And he can but, scheme very well on that. But again, people would kill to have that Buffalo Bills job if McDermott gets fired. Yeah, 100% true. 100% true. But we'll do, let's get into our next thing real quick. And then um, we've got a couple of things before we go into the second half of the show. But um, if you want to give us a call, 929 we'll get you on the air. And we do have the Facebook chat up and running. But uh, next thing, Frank Reich, he did not last an entire season for the second straight year in a row because Dave Tapper decided to go ahead and fire him. And here's the thing, Frank Reich, I get it. It's like a similar situation. Well, it's actually a worse situation than what he had in Indianapolis because Indianapolis, I mean, Ursa is just a moron and he can't, and they can't even build a line to save their own life. Tepper, on the other hand, <laughs> oh my God, you have a rookie QB, you have no offensive line, you basically mortgaged the future. And of course, you basically made Frank Reich the scapegoat, <laughs> where basically he was the sacrificial lamb, and you decided to fire him. And you wonder why why someone's not winning if they're one in ten. Hello, Dave Tepper, you're the problem, not necessarily Reich, although Reich did a lot of crappy things in in Carolina, but he had nothing to work with. Here's how I look at this: Frank Reich, I believe, is a good coach as a as an offensive coordinator, a hundred percent. Mm-hmm. He was a big part of why the Eagles won the Super Bowl a few years ago. Absolutely. But as a head coach, forget it. Forget it. Most Eagles offensive coordinators within the last half decade have not panned out. Shane Steichen is the head coach in Indianapolis. That's kind of steering the ship a little bit. Mm-hmm. Frank Wright can fuck off because that guy cannot coach as a you know as as the head man, which again, if a team wants to bring in Frank Wright as an offensive coordinator, I'm all for it. But as a head coach, it's not worth bringing up. So another thing I think, if I, remember, if I remember reading it correctly, Andy mentioned it earlier today in a private chat of ours. He said that the Indianapolis Colts alone are owning Frank Reich $36 million since he signed a four-year extension yeah. with them a few years ago. And Carolina, I think, is paying half of that. I think it was like 20 to $40 million. I think you, What did you say earlier? Yeah, it was at least 20 that's insane. So he's going to be loaded with that. Oh, yeah. He's making bank and he's not even having to do anything. So I'm yeah. like, man, that's like, OK, you got a lot of a lot of dead money coming in here. It's like, all right, you know, it ain't too bad. Right. And on top of all that, the Panthers are just I like them. Te- I like them as a team. But holy shit, Tepper turned them into a nightmare. Hell, as much as Jerry Richardson passed away a few years ago, I would rather have the ghost of Jerry Richardson running the organization than David Tepper. Yeah, here's a good comparison. David Tepper is Dan Snyder 2.0. Oh, God, are you serious? <laughs> hey, that's some of the comparisons that I'm seeing. He literally meddles in every single thing known to mankind, and anything that Tepper touches turns to crap. Well, to be fair, he's not going out suing 80-year-olds for reneging on their season tickets or, you know, trademarking something that shouldn't be. You know what I mean? Right. Which okay, so Snyder was so Snyder one up Tepper on that, but oh man, how Carolina mortgaged the future to get CJ Stroud. <laughs> the, and you know what's even stupider is Dave Tepper immediately after they fired Frank Reich, he openly admitted it. It's saying they were intentionally going to originally draft CJ Stroud. So why did you pass up on him? Right. Exactly. God. It's like why? I'm going to say this now. If the Panthers don't do anything in the offseason for that offensive line, which is atrocious, by the way. Oh, yeah. The, the, the Panthers are not going anywhere with Bryce Young, and he's going to be labeled as a bust. And I'm going to say that poor kid never got a chance in Carolina. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And my guess is Tepper probably won't. 
oh god he better pray that somebody will actually yeah. be willing to spend money to go into those games and to tell you the truth that's definitely in the books for road to 32 mm-hmm. very true although it's interesting my brother-in-law mentioned uh, he did hear a couple rumors about the afc north next year yeah, that that's true. There's yeah, and, tra- sure. and Brian Trainer actually said something to me. He said when we were in Philadelphia, he mentioned because we were talking about going on road to 32 to Baltimore or Detroit. He said that it goes based on the standings. So for example, because Miami's now in first place in the AFC East, they're gonna play the Lions next year. And the Bills are are gonna are very likely could either play the Vikings or the Packers. I would I will Say this in front of everybody now on the air. If it is Bills versus Green Bay, we're going to Lambeau. We're going to go to both. We're going to go to both Seattle or Green Bay or whoever. I don't know. Uh, Because I've read Seattle somewhere. So if Seattle is on that list, I don't know 100% yet. But if they are, I would love to do Seattle. I'm also open to doing the Green Bay. Green Bay would Mm -hmm. be fun too. I've also read that – what was I going to say? I've also read Indianapolis is on there. I'm not 100% sure, but I want to see it for myself yeah. in January until the Buffalo Bills announce it officially because that's when the opponents come out. Then at that point, we'll have a better understanding of who's going to be at. Well, we still don't know who's going to be on Road to 32 next right. year. We just know that possibly Green Bay or Minnesota is on that list. Seattle, I saw for sure. Houston, I saw for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's going to get very interesting you know, with what comes up, but – then on top of so so besides Frank Wright getting fired, there was a lot of interesting action over the Thanksgiving holiday. And of course, we had our first Black Friday game. But <laughs> man, Jesus, some Christ. of what we saw was absolutely insane. It I even, saw the I saw the funnier. encore. Yeah. And even funnier. This past Monday night, the Bears versus the Vikings. ESPN, that was absolutely one of the shittiest Monday night games I can ever remember. (laughs) The Bears won with no touchdowns. They only scored field goals. God. I, I I cannot with this fucking with this fucking sport. I cannot. We have so much shit going on and Let me just get to the Jets for a second. I didn't get a chance to see this game because we were on our way to Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. By the time that Britt and I got to Philadelphia, the game was pretty much over. It ended around like 6 o'clock or 6.30. And I saw the highlight, the Hail Mary on Black Friday or the Fail Mary. Oh, Jesus. What the fuck? That's the most Jetsy thing possible. Yeah, it is. Oh, my God. I can say... A lot of these games are train wrecks. Yeah, you want to know talk speaking of train wrecks, you want to hear a big train wreck? Yeah. Stop me if you've heard this before. The Jets are stupid. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've said that a few times on this show. God <laughs> oh, damn it. You see what they just did? Yep. And I, I will say Robert Sala's definitely on the hot seat now. <laughs> he should be. Because right. you are you are so desperate. Okay. Time out. First of all, the Jets are a fucking clusterfuck. We all know this. First off, Aaron Rodgers goes down. He's declared out for the season. And then he all of a sudden magically drinks some silly juice. And now he wants to come back on Christmas Eve against the Commanders. Yeah. And like, apparently now they're claiming he's in the 21-day window. I'm like, what? What is wrong with them? Oh, and my favorite part is how people now think that Aaron Rodgers didn't really tear his Achilles. How? Everything said he did. He had ACL surgery. Some people think that he didn't even actually, you know, tear it. They think that he tore his ACL in the offseason, but then he actually ruptured his Achilles in the same play. I don't know exactly what people were saying, but that's a pretty big claim to make of somebody who's at the age of Aaron Rodgers. I, I seriously cannot stress this enough. Why the fuck are the Jets, even in any sort of fashion, trying to get Aaron Rodgers to come back so quickly. Yeah. It's been 80 days since Aaron Rodgers ruptured that sweet, sweet Achilles. Like, what is wrong with you guys? Right. Jets fans are delusional. Seriously. And now they're getting all excited because geriatric Aaron Rodgers has come back. You realize back. that it, You do realize that if he gets hit at least once, his career is over. Oh, yeah. And I guarantee you, if 
oh, we got a nice little fight here in the game. But if he were by some miracle upon miracle upon miracle actually show up, I guarantee you someone goes after the knee first thing. I'm remotely convinced that Aaron Rodgers doesn't actually give a fuck about being with the Jets. I think he's doing this because he wants attention. It wouldn't surprise me. I mean, because that's what he is. Type of player. He's the NFL's biggest slut. I don't call mm. him a diva. He is a slut in in the <laughs> NFL world because all this guy cares about is pretty much saying, I want to play at 40 years old with a ruptured Achilles, just 80 days from exploding it. Like, how do you, how is that even remotely possible? It's like if you right. tore your ACL and you come back in two months. Yeah, this just doesn't happen. No. Yeah. Hey, hey, NFL's legalized prostitution. Here you go. <laughs> Rogers, perfect example of wanting the money and not giving I'm a so crap. Glad his, I'm so glad that his career is almost over at this point. I'm yeah. so sick of hearing his shit. And people say that he was bad in Green Bay. He's worse in here than he was in Green Bay. Yeah, very true. Very oh, true. Oh, I want attention. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I can't exactly. fucking stand him. Well, he's in the biggest media market now, New York City. Yep. Here you go. So, yep. Have fun with that, Jets yeah. fans. Exactly. So, with that, what we'll do? It's kind of fun how how quick a half hour goes. So, on the other side of the break, we're gonna come back. We're gonna talk about the Sabers. Talk about some moves. Patty Kane is on the move also. So, stay with us. We'll be right back. I'm Tom Wuchek, co-host of Buffalo After Dark. Founded by Matthew Keeler, Dishon is a Buffalo-based fashion label focusing on continuous experimentation in hockey. Their work consists of products, content, and experiences that inspire creativity. Playful curation provides energy that sparks a unique perspective and an ideology around seeing the game differently. Now you can save. Log on to JustDishon.com and use promo code WUJEK at checkout. You'll save 10% on all of your purchases. That is spelled W-U-J-E-K. Dishon has built an influential following devoted to the infusion of creative expression through high quality goods and tasteful collaboration. If you love creative products that push the boundaries, check out Dishon. Visit their website at justdishon.com. This is Buffalo's Uncensored Sports Show. You're watching Buffalo After Dark. Welcome back to the second half of Buffalo After Dark. Of course, you got both of us here. Bobby's going to tell us a little bit about his trip from Philly um, towards the end of the show and uh, what it was like to be a Bills fan in the Eagles nest. But if Gosh. you want to give us a call, <laughs> yeah, if you want to give us a call, 1992056099, we'll get you on the air. Of course, we've got the chat up and running. Trainer joined us earlier in the chat as well, which um, <laughs> I, I had to throw the laughing face back at him for him saying fly, Eagles, fly. But a lot of moves on the Sabres this past weekend. And actually, one of the things that came up, the Sabres went into Madison Square. Uh, they went into Madison Square Garden against the Rangers. And a lot of Rangers fans were pissed off as uh, the, arguably the number one team in the NHL got their ass whooped by Buffalo 5-1 and UPL had save of the year. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I got to say, first off, for those who want to know my opinion, I can't really give you an opinion because... For some reason, the Philadelphia Sports Network is exclusive in Philadelphia, nowhere in New York or Jersey. So I apologize in advance. I had to go to a place called Chickies and Pete's to get the Sabres-Devils game on Saturday, but I did not get the Ranger game on Monday. So I'm just going to come out straightforward and clean and say that. But I did see the save online. I saw it on Facebook, mm. and I saw it on X. Holy moly, that was something. Who would have thought UPL had that in them? And and here we are a year later after we were talking about deal UPL now because he was playing like absolute horseshit for two seasons. And now he's sort of reemerged as like, you know what? This is what I was seeing with him back in the time when he was in the rookie camps when we were going live from the Harbor Center like four or five years ago. It's like he reemerged. Or Maybe something. his confidence is starting to pick up. Right, or either that well, or he I mean, finally healed up after two hip surgeries. Well, I mean, when, once you get surgery in your hips, I mean, a lot of players do that. Once you get hip surgery, your rap, your play starts to rapidly decline. And 
unfortunately, a lot of those players tend to end up in their mid thirties, like Patrick Kane, Patrick mm-hmm. Kane, which we'll get to in a bit. He's a perfect example. We don't know how much time he has left in the NHL. I mean, he's going to be a future hall of famer, but oh, yeah. he had hip surgery and look at him now. He, it took him months just to sign with the team. He was supposed to sign in July. It's almost December. That's yeah. six months. He just signed the other day. Yeah. We'll get to that in a little bit, yeah. but Holy moly. I got to say the Sabres as of late, they probably took out all of their frustration from the devil's game on Saturday. They took it out on the Rangers. Yeah. And it's a good comeback game because a, they needed to do that. B they beat one of the best teams in the league. And right now, one of the other things that that came out is that this uh, UPL is going to be the starter going forward and Comrie, they're going to work in the, as a, as a duo. Uh, Eric, um, or I'm sorry, <laughs> Devin Levi got sent down to Rochester. And this was one of the moves that was that a lot of people were wondering about because of course we were writing all three goalies and what the fact is UPL. Okay. He's playing well, ride the hot goaltender Comrie. He was ass in Jersey, but then the entire team didn't show up. So, okay. You know, it is what it is. And Levi had to bail him out and Levi still let in three. But then Levi, at the same time, you could tell he's still a raw talent. He needs development. And I think Adams actually made a good move in this case by sending him down to the AHL because, let's be honest, I mean, Levi, he's going to be a great goaltender. He's shown what he can do. He came in. He performed great at the end of last season. This season, he has not been as good as what we saw last year. And a lot of that is because he got rushed and they were basically throwing him to the wolves. So at least now when I listen to um, Kevin Adams press conference and when he was talking about it, basically his thoughts were, well, with having Levi down in the Amherst is a much more structured pr- practice environment. It's a lot more development environment. You should have did this from the start. I agree. Versus throwing them to the wolves. Now, right. I understand last year we were hurting at goaltender because we had several of them out. So, of course, Levi's going to get the call up. But right now, you're not running into the issue. UPL's not hurt. Comrie's not hurt. UPL's playing a hell of a lot better than he has the last two seasons. So and Comrie's been ass since he signed there. Yeah, exactly, which I wouldn't mind getting rid of him. But at the same time, give Levi the, the development time he needs because that is something where if we rush him, we're going to have another Mikhail Gregorenko situation where basically it's like, oh, well, I don't I don't think um, Levi would necessarily go the way Gregorenko did, but Gregorenko was like, no, no, oh, no, because oh, Gregorenko was shit. a top 12 pick. Yeah, and- yeah, and Gregorenko was like, oh, I'm the shit. There's no way I'm ever going to the AHL. You can't bury me in the AHL. And what happens? He ends up quitting. And goes to a KHL, and I don't even know if he's still playing or not. And I don't. Well, no, he got traded for. He was in the Ryan O'Reilly deal with Nikita Zadorov. Yeah, and obviously then he still didn't do anything. So, well, at least Zadorov has a job in the NHL. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Greg Renko found his way out pretty quick. I, you know, what's really sad is at the time I was very, very, I was very, very high on Greg Renko, and I remember during the lockout, I think it was in 2012, like right after the Kings won the cup, mm-hmm. I remember being so hyped about Greg Renko when they drafted him, and they're like, well, he was going to be their new Evgeny Malkin, basically, and yeah. what the Sabers should have never have done at the time, and Darcy Gear fucked this up big in time. I mean, looking back on it, what he should have done was told him, listen, Mikhail, you're a talented hockey player. But you need to shut up and you got to go play in the AHL or play in, you know, in the junior leagues at that time. Because he was like 18, 19 at the time. Mm -hmm. You don't rush those kinds of players. But the Sabres, unfortunately, did that. And he he had this big ego. who said bit him in the ass. It bit him in the ass. And just recently, I think a year ago, whenever, I don't know what he's doing now, but if I remember correctly, he got a free agent contract from the Columbus Blue Jackets, and I have not heard anything from him since. Yeah, so actually, here's what happened. The NHL rejected the contract. Oh, good. Fuck him. <laughs> so good. so Fuck basically, him. so here's what happened. So, um, and this is actually in Wikipedia, surprisingly. I'm actually looking at it now, but. Um, they had to refile the contract on the first day of free agency for 2020 and the 21 season. So um, July 13th, 2020, Greg Orenko was officially signed by the Blue Jackets. However, after attending the Blue Jackets training camp, 
Gregorenko did make the opening night roster, making his debut and playing his first NHL game in four years, uh, which was a three to one loss to the Predators. Um, however, Gregorenko did absolutely nothing um, offensively. And he ended up being a healthy scratch midway through the season. And then he finished all together four goals, 12 points through 32 games. And he basically decided, you know what? I'm going back to Russia as an impending free agent. And he signed a three-year deal with CSKA Moscow of the KHL. So basically he took the Ilya Kovalchuk, you know, route. Yep. But the only difference was Ilya Kovalchuk was a superstar in the NHL at that time. Yeah. And then he got that massive extension with the Devils and just retires one year after signing that extension. And then the Devils ran into some cap problems because mm-hmm. of that for a yep. handful of years. So I remember all this, dude. And then Gregoranko was just – acting like he was hot shit and then it bit him in the ass. He thought he was going to be making it as smoothly easy as possible for himself, which never turned out that way. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And he has done absolutely zero in the NHL. Now with him going back to the KHL, um, he's not even, he's like a shadow of his former self because when you look at how he played in, in, in the, the Quebec major junior hockey league, you know, his last couple seasons before he joined us, I mean, he was scoring like 30 and 40 goals a season. And now um, during his time um, when he was up in the NHL, I mean, he had scored like the highest season he ever had 2016, 2017. He ended up scoring 10 goals with the Colorado Avalanche. He never went above three goals on the Buffalo Sabres. And then when he goes to Columbus, he only scored four goals during a season. So the highest he ever had in the NHL was it was one 10 goal season. Well, maybe if his ego wasn't checked, maybe he would have actually been a really good player for the Sabres and he would have probably either been traded or he would have still been here. It would have been a star, but nope, his ego ruined him. So I want nothing to do with Mikhail Gregorenko. Exactly. And then the best season he ever had in the KHL was last year, 2022-23, when he actually scored 22 goals. What does that tell you? He's a has-been. Well, that's his problem. Yep, exactly. So so basically, with that being said, Mikel Gregorigo, fuck you very much. <laughs> you're yeah. a loser, and basically, you're this overhyped player who decided to have this ego basically destroy your career, and you're a bust, plain and simple. You're just more nothing more than a role player at this point. Yeah, basically. But I want to mention real quick about Levi, and that is I'm really happy that the pressure mounted on Kevin Adams because people were saying, send him to Rochester, send him to Rochester. Mm -hmm. So comparing to Grigorenko, you know, if the Sabres did not send him to the AHL, then this probably would have been another situation with like Mika Noren or anything in between, you know, that every Sabres goalie outside of, you know, like Ryan Miller, um, they would probably be back at square one. And because of all the hype in college and because of all the hype in, you know, in the NCAA with Northwestern Huskies, um, everybody was excited. And, you know, that's eye candy. And then the Sabres call him up because at the time, like you said, they had injuries. And, you know, Anderson was going to retire. UPL, I believe, was hurt. It was either UPL or Comrie. And then yeah. um, Levi gets the call. And he was unbelievable because nobody had film on him. And Trevor said this a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And then now summer progresses. People were so excited about the future. And they're like, yes, they got to get a veteran goalie. And they don't even bother. So instead, right. they keep a three-wheel transition with Levi in the middle. And I'm thinking to myself, okay. So the next thing you know, they try him out, whatever. And Levi then gets hurt for uh, temporarily. And then he comes back. And then it's like, you know, Comrie doesn't do it. Comrie doesn't do himself any favors. And then Lukanen was probably the best one out of all of them this year when it was the complete opposite. Levi was the best goalie outside of Anderson. So then the tables have been flipped and it's like, okay, Levi is, is on the verge of losing his confidence at 21 years old. You have to send him down to Rochester. And that's exactly what they did. And I'm very happy they did that because yeah. if they didn't, they would have another goalie in the NHL that they would have potentially ruined. Exactly. And, and with how Adams was talking about it and he, and he said to Levi straight up, it's not a reflection of the type of player he is. It's basically, we want to develop you. So we know you can be even better going forward. So 
I get that point, you know, and I'm glad that he took it that way versus the approach that Regeer took with, with Mikhail Gregorenko. At least they're going to give Levi the development time, and at least they're going to play him quite a bit in Rochester, which is good. And Rochester is a good team in the AHL. They're a playoff team. So he's going to have those opportunities to really shine a net and he's going to get more games that he can actually start. So then he can develop his consistency and he can really see how a lot of the pro game works. Um, and he has some experience now, but now he's going to get more consistency out of that and he'll get that playing time. So I'm glad that they did decide to do that smart move. I will totally give him credit for that. And now we'll, keep track of Levi as best we can, obviously, but if, you know, get it like a season or two of development down there, it's not a bad thing. And Hey, Ryan Miller played in Rochester, even and he turned out to be one of the best North American goalies that's ever played. So you give them that development time, you give them that attention and you let them, you know, see the game more and more. It's not a bad thing. No. And plus Levi also commented about the situation. He's like, listen, I'm happy to be down here in Rochester. I get the chance to play. I get a chance to develop. And I think it's best for myself and for the team and yada, yada, yada. See, I think that's the difference. (laughs) That's a huge difference. And guess what? For a 21 year old who's going to be 22 in a couple of weeks, Mm -hmm. you have to give him a lot of credit because of the fact that Mm -hmm. at his age, you would think, well, he's good enough to be in the NHL. He needs more time and he could have been selfish But instead, he basically said, okay, I'll go to Rochester. I'll do what's best for the team, and I'll do what's best for myself in my career, which I respect that. I do. Absolutely. I think that's a very smart thing to do. Absolutely. Because it shows. the opportunity. Yeah, exactly. And plus, he gets playing time. He's in a good system. He knows what – I'm not going to say he knows the team because he just met them recently. Right. But I think for a 21-year-old to go directly from college – to the NHL and become something like the next Andre Vasilevsky to me is a huge tall task. And yeah. it's remotely it, impossible to do. Yeah. I was going to say it virtually never happens. So the fact no. that he's willing to take the opportunity and that's a great thing. And at the same time, he's going to learn what a lot of these up and coming players do. And not only just on the Amherst, but across all of the teams. So he's going to be able to see what these tendencies are, and he's going to get to understand a lot of the finer points of the game, which is good. So think of it in this sense where when he was in the juniors, okay, that's like your, that's like your high school hockey league. Then you go into the Amherst. That's basically your college level stuff or a little bit higher. Then think about the NHL. That's like your top of the end. That's like your best in class. So He's going to get time to see what a lot of the up and coming players are doing. He's going to get time to understand more about what the systems are because Rochester plays a very similar system to what we do up here. So that's a good thing. And, you know, the more playing time he gets, the more he gets to understand the game, it's going to only help him. And I like the fact that he's putting the team first and not himself like Gregorenko did. Oh yeah. Well, Greg Orango was just a selfish prick. So, and that, and you wonder why so many goalies, like let's say for example, Andre Vasilevsky. Andre Vasilevsky was a top 15 pick in the time mm-hmm. of his draft. He was a first round pick. I remember when the Lightning traded for Ben Bishop, I remember saying to myself, well, Vasilevsky is probably in the minors. He's in the AHL. He's going to develop and become a great goalie at some point. But then Ben Bishop is in Tampa Bay. They go to the Stanley Cup Finals in 2015 with Ben Bishop. And then like two years later, they traded him to the Kings. And then they called him Vasilevsky. And then from there, they, he never looked back. He became one of the best goalies in the NHL, and he's probably going to be a future Hall of Famer when it's all said and done. Mm -hmm. So with that said, Devin Levi could very well stay in Rochester, have him stay for at least, in my opinion, at least stay for two to three years. Because if you give a kid at that age that much time, they're going to get better and better and better. Goalies don't just magically turn 21 and just become elite in the NHL. That doesn't right. fucking happen. So, exactly. re- so realistically, this is probably the best situation that the Sabres could have put themselves in. Yeah. 
and it bolsters uh, Rochester's goaltending depth also. So you know Levi is going to be towards the top of that depth list. So give him the playing time. Let him develop. Give him experience. He's going to get playoff experience down there because Rochester is a good team. So that also is going to help because he can further build his confidence. And then, and then of course, if needed, if we have to bring a goaltender up for a game or two here and there, we can still do that. So it's not a bad thing. He's not completely out of Buffalo whatsoever. It's just now he's getting the time to actually put the time in. It's similar to what Ryan Miller did in his first year or two up here. Similar to what other goaltenders do. I mean, you look at other goaltenders throughout the league, same type of situation. You know, it, it's it's just, it's that rite of passage. Right, exactly. And it should be taken, like the approach, before we move on, it has to be approached very differently. It's not like a forward or a defenseman where they take about a year or two to develop. Goalies take a long time, physically, mentally. Mm-hmm. So for Devin Levi, I love that he, even though he was been pretty bad, for the majority of the first half of the year, I'm glad the Sabres, like I said, I'm glad that they, they pulled the plug and they said, you have to go to Rochester. It's not a punishment, but it's this is going to be very good for you. And we know that you want to play in the NHL, but this is what you got to do if you want to stay around. And he's like, sure, I'll do it. Yeah. So, so good stuff. And of course, as a result of that, um, UPL gets a win against the Rags. We're back to 500 at least. So now we just have to go forward. And and actually one of the big pieces of news that came out um, within the last couple of days, uh, Patrick Kane is back on a team and he has decided to do a one-year deal with the Detroit Red Wings. Okay. First off, why Detroit? Yeah, exactly. That made no why sense Detroit? when I heard about that. Like, and, and the excuse is, oh, it's because I get to play with Alex to break it. Yeah, this, so this is basically, you're not there to win the Cubs. You're just there because you like to play with Alex to break it with the time with the Hawks. That's the only reason why he's with the Red Wings. And it's a one-year deal for, I think, like $1.75 million or something. Yeah, and something low. I actually saw that signing happen. as And believe it or not, I will tell you this in a minute. I saw the notification at the end of the tour for the Eastern State Penitentiary, which is very interesting because it was like a prison. And and the funny thing was that felt like a prison with the Iser plan. And he's been the GM for five years and then they have done nothing. Yeah, they're competitive right now, but how long will it last? Right. And in the fact that he decided to go to Detroit, which is barely doing anything. I mean, come on, Patty Kane, you're better than you- that. You could have went to Dallas and you could have been on a Stanley Cup contender, but instead you go to the Red Wings. Exactly. But well, then he again, could, he could have gone to the Devils even and been on a cup contender. He could have went back to the Rangers, but they couldn't afford it. But right. I would have said this, and that is, is that if it was not going to be the Rangers, Buffalo was on the list. But at this point, we all know what Buffalo is going to look like right now. Yeah, um, maybe 500 at best and like fringe wildcard team possibly depending if the Sabres push the right buttons, but right. um, you know, obviously he, he could have went to Toronto. He could have went to Boston. He could have went to the Dallas stars. Like I mentioned before, there was talks about the devils. There was talks about the Islanders, even a possible return to the Rangers. And then all of a sudden Florida was in the mix. So there were a lot of teams in there that he could have went for, but he goes to the Red Wings. Like why you're going yeah. to a French playoff team. It just made no sense. And plus, I think, in my opinion, I think the Sabres dodged a huge bullet with Patrick Kane. Because, well, yeah, they're not on the hook for that $1.75 million or whatever he signed for. And on top of that, you know, what happens if Patty Kane gets hurt again? Then you're on the hook. Basically. And the Red Wings only have him for one year. So if he doesn't pan out, they cut their losses. Exactly. And then if you want Patty Kane that bad, you could sign him and probably do for just over a million for like a year or something. I mean, you don't even have to offer the 1.7 or whatever he paid for. This, like this whole thing reminds me of at the time when Marty Brodeur left the Devils because he had a huge feud with, with Lou Lamorello. And I remember mm-hmm. this because I was at Marty Brodeur's last game in the NHL when he was with the St. Louis Blues. This yeah. is deja vu for me. Because not that Patrick Kane was traded to the Rangers and never played again. He went to a team that nobody thought was going to sign with him. And he goes for playing time and does minimum to nothing. Patrick Kane, you have people have to understand, Patrick Kane is 35 years old. He's on the verge of, of hanging up the skates. 
for good. He's mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. But we don't know how good he's going to be because the answer is understand. He also got hip surgery. So this is a pretty big th a deal. Like a lot of Red Wings fans are under the impression that they're going to be like the Showtime era with like the 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 Showtime era of Patrick Kane when he was with Chicago. That's what they're expecting. And that's far from reality. He's not who he used to be. He's outside <laughs> of his prime. He's on the downside of his career. And that's what happens with a lot of aging players that sign with the Red Wings. Like, you know how many players the Red Wings have had in the last decade when Ken Holland was the GM? They had Mike Madonna. They had Danny Alfredson. Yeah, they had that's good. Chris Osgood won cups, though. Yeah. Yeah, Dominic Hoshik, he was another one. Mm -hmm. But again, at least with Osgood and Hoshik together, they won a cup. So I'll give the Red Wings that. But I'm talking about past the, like, past the, you know, the, the streak when they were trying to get into the playoffs. Yeah. That streak is over. And exactly. oh, I forgot to mention one. Franz Nielsen, former Islander superstar. Franz Nielsen signed a massive deal with the Wings. Didn't pan out. And one mm -hmm. appearance in the All-Star game. And that was it. So my point is the Red Wings go for trends. And just because they're up and rising does not necessarily mean that you're going to get the version of Patrick Kane from 10 years ago. Right. 100% right on that. And, and speaking now, if of, he was in his prime, I would absolutely, I would absolutely say this is a huge gap for the Red Wings, but this is not the same Patrick Kane anymore. Yeah. He's far outside of it. I mean, literally Patrick um, Kane's prime was done like four or five years ago at this and point. the Red Wings even straight up said that Patty Kane's not even going to be dressing for the team for another week. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, what does that tell you? you've got somebody at the end of their career. It, it's abysmal at that point to think that, and I'm not saying the Sabres didn't try because I'm sure they did, but mm -hmm. like maybe this was a blessing for the Sabres. Right. Because, yeah. because the only way I see this happening with Patrick Kane was if like, I mean, obviously Yuri Kulik went back to Rochester, but like if like a postal got hurt and he was out for the year, that would I would understand. But mm -hmm. again, Patrick Kane is a future Hall of Famer. He's getting, he's going to the hall when his career is done. Oh, yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, he'll be in Toronto in a few years. But yeah, likely first ballot, too. Yeah, absolutely. First ballot. And he's already listed as one of the top 100 greatest players of all time with Patrick Kane. I mean, with Jonathan Taves, excuse me. Mm -hmm. But again, this is not the Patrick Kane that we all grew up with. Like, this is like Twilight Year Marty Brodeur 2.0. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. So. We'll see how things go over there. I mean, but honestly, I mean, I was not expecting Detroit whatsoever when it came to that. But good luck, Detroit. You're going to need it. And and we'll talk about our last couple things here, too, because we've, we're down to our last, um, like, seven minutes or so. But Anthony Bovillier ended up getting traded to the Hawks. And this is actually another piece of news that ended up coming out a little bit earlier in the week. And I'm like, all right, Chicago, you got some work to do because right now, you still got to build that offense. You still got to build that roster. And right now you can't expect Connor Bedard to do every single thing because he's just a rookie. Right. But I think Chicago, excuse me. I think Chicago was already running into some problems because first off, Taylor Hall got knee surgery. He's out for the year. Yep. Then a few days later, the allegations about Corey Perry came out. And for those who want to know, Corey Perry was allegedly, uh, banging Connor Bedard's mom. And apparently the Blackhawks, once again, because they clearly done such a great job with covering up, you know, dirty things behind the back in the past, quote unquote, you know, with the whole sexual assault thing with Kyle Beach. And now they're doing this. Now they're just kissing, you know, Connor Bedard in the ass with covering up Corey Perry with his allegations with banging his mom. The poor kid does not deserve to know about these things. And the right. Chicago Blackhawks are already doing him dirty. And the fact that the NHL and the fans itself have straight up said, do not, please do not put Connor Bernard in Chicago. What does the NHL do? They, they put, put him, him in Chicago. Chicago. They put him in Chicago. And guess what? Corey Perry, the top guy they were supposed to bring in as a mentor to be the veteran leader for Connor Bernard, mm -hmm. decides to be a douchebag and decides to be a dilf and starts banging, you know, Connor Bernard's mom. And then it, it just became a very betrayal setup. Like that's not a good environment if no, you're Chicago. And so what do you not. do to and what do you do to address this mess? Oh, I know. Let's go trade for Anthony Beauvillier. 
Chicago is a dumpster fire. You're not kidding. Chicago is a – and you know what's really sad? If you remember a while back, Anthony Beauvillier was in the Bo Horvat trade just nine months ago. Mm-hmm. Really think about that. Yeah, and that's absolutely crazy to think where we were then and where we are now. Beauvillier, I thought, was going to be a great fit for Vancouver, and I thought he was phenomenal when he got traded there. He was getting a lot of playing time. He was going to do this. He was going to do that. And then Chicago, and then Vancouver just straight up spits in his face, and they told him to fuck off. You're going to the Windy City. And what did they get in return for him? A fifth round pick. Like, what exactly did yeah. that do? Yeah, virtually zero. <laughs> I mean, look, as an Islander fan, I like Anthony Beauvillier. I feel really bad for him. He's going from Vancouver, who somehow magically drank some silly juice and became one of the best teams yeah. in the NHL, possibly a one year wonder, to Chicago. And yeah. they are a dumpster fire. Yeah. <laughs> Bad stuff. Bad Jesus stuff. Jesus Christ. Yeah. It truly is. It's it's amazing how things can, can do that. But it'll also be interesting to see where Corey Perry ends up ultimately out of this, which nobody knows right now. But I don't think anybody's going to sign him, to be honest. Yeah. It might be one of those things. Hey, you're exiled from the NHL, basically. Well, I mean, it's still a pretty shitty thing to do. Like, Corey Perry literally took the Zach Wilson route. But except that situation was far different compared to what Corey Perry did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it truly was. But Like, when Zach Wilson did it, we all thought that was funny. But what Corey Perry did was pretty disastrous. Mm -hmm. Like, I I can't comprehend that at all. That a veteran who knows better not to do that ends up having, you know, to bang a 18 year old kid's mom. Yeah, that is just absolutely crazy. With, Talk about um, sad affair happening. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you can't be doing that, man. Cannot be doing that. I'm sorry. That's going to really hit. It. I think that's going to take a huge toll on Connor Bedard's confidence, honestly. Yeah, it would. It's like, 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 what's he going to think? He goes to another city. Oh, another player is going to do that. Like, why would you do that? Yeah, that's like one of those unwritten rules. You just don't do that. <laughs> Imagine if they were roommates. Oh, Jesus. It's very possible, too, because in the beginning, when Bedard got drafted and then Perry went to Chicago, they were like, buddy, buddy, two months in. Right. He betrayed him. Yeah. <sighs> wow. It's like talking about destroying a kid's confidence, man. That is just brutal. Like I said, and I sound like a broken record, but I feel really, really bad for Connor Bedard. Like he's going to be a great hockey player in the NHL, but he's 18. He's a little boy. Yeah. He did not deserve that. No, he doesn't. And actually, he no didn't. player does. No, no player deserves that. Yeah. But that, that is just. That's Corey Perry's a, Corey Perry's a piece of shit for doing that, honestly. Yeah, exactly. And of course, I mean, a lot of that stuff's online too. With uh, some of the different magazines like Hooked on Hockey, I know had a big feature on that. So, so yeah, if you want to want to take a look at that? Definitely feel free. But you know, let's round up the show on a better note because we got a few minutes. So, Road to Thirty Two Philadelphia Edition will be coming out soon on our YouTube page. Yeah, I uh, just to give you a quick heads up what's going on, I'm going to turn off the background so you guys can see what I'm going to present to you. And I mentioned earlier in the show, I will be visibly telling you what I got. So, yes, I'm in the middle of editing the third chapter of Road to 32 for the Philadelphia Eagles trip. So I'm halfway there. Um, It's not done yet, but it should be out within a week. So I'm excited to publish that. But as for the trip as a whole, I know you've been wanting to ask me all kinds of questions. So fire away. I know you have a lot to ask me. Well, one, I know that the Philadelphia fan base is uh, a little bit on with what you were saying, like top three uh, worst fan bases out of everyone in the NFL. Yeah, I, I said that to you before the show. And I said from firsthand experience of all the teams I've seen thus far on Road to 32, Eagles fans are by far the worst because I've ran into so many problems with them at the stadium. I'm I'm not even, and that's within a non-life threatening situation. So mm-hmm. with that being said, um, yeah, I got booed. I was expected to get booed. I knew mentally what to expect. So it's not like I was going in there saying, wow, I didn't know they could do that. 
Like right. Eagles fans do that regardless of who they play. They do oh, yeah. it to they do it to babies, to toddlers, mm-hmm. for God's sake. Yeah, they boo Santa Claus even. <laughs> yeah, and they threw snowballs at the poor guy because they weren't mm-hmm. losing enough to get a high draft pick at the time. Right. right. Like, Jesus Christ. And they also throw batteries at their own players, and they fight each other because there's legitimately, when I say this, there are good people that are Eagles fans. They don't participate in this bullshit. And some of them even said that the people who do that give the Eagles fan base a, a bad name, which I can understand. But it also sums up your entire fan base in a nutshell because of how fucking rowdy you guys are. So right. on top of all that, at the game – when the Bills were up 17-7 after, I think it was when Josh Allen scored that first rushing touchdown, mm-hmm. which is like a nine-yard rushing touchdown or whatever, I had an Eagles fan straight up three rows down from me. He was wearing a brown jacket, if I remember correctly, and he had the audacity to say, hope you could do that and you can get out alive, basically threatening me as I was celebrating. And the only reason I know about this is because my wife, Brittany, literally nudged me down and she said that guy in front of you just threatened you and i'm like what did he say and so sure enough he says um that hope you hopefully you can get out of here alive and there were eagles fans just just booing and telling me to sit the fuck down shut the fuck up and whatever but when they do it they're all like ha 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 eagles are better or you know how they are they're rowdy But the one I think that really takes the cake was after the game. It was a massive, like, rainstorm, like hard rain in Philly throughout the whole game. So I was sitting behind, like, a shading area where I'm not even wet through the game, which was great. But after the game was where it became a problem. So I'm getting out of the link, and the next thing you know, there was a tent on my left, and there was at least maybe – nine to 10 Eagles fans and they're all drinking or whatever. And as a fan, you know, of not only the bills, but the game of football. And I do this for hockey too. And I'm like, listen, you guys played a good game and that's all that matters. So drive home safe and whatever. One Eagles fan had the audacity to say to me, and I quote to go fuck myself just because I said, congratulations, you know, drive safe. Oh, Jesus. (laughs) Yeah. That, Uh, then of course, then, of course, there was a viral video of, like, the little kid flipping off a Bills fan when he tried to give him a high five for congratulating on a good game. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, that went viral. And a lot of people are like, wow, he was raised right. I'm like, no, he was not. Exactly. That's childish. There were people that were had the audacity to threaten a human being they'd never met in their life over a football game. Like, yeah, I yeah. love football. I love the Bills. I love watching the NFL and all that. But I don't take it to that extreme. It's a game. Exactly. Exactly. It's a game at the end of the day. Um, But I will say this, though, if you and and I know you mentioned this off air, the link is a much better stadium than Paycor was. Hands down. Hands down. And I will say the presentation, I compared the link to Arrowhead. It's the East Coast equivalent to Arrowhead Stadium. Eagles fans were dressed in Kelly green jerseys and midnight green. And they had like a block party as you, soon as you get into the link and walks you into the Eagles team store, you know, drinking or whatever. And sure enough, that whole city, like let's say for example, if like the Phillies and trainer actually told me this, he said that even if the flyers or the Phillies win a championship tomorrow, he straight up said, Nobody in that city actually gives a shit. All they talk about is the Eagles. That's all they want to talk about. That tells you something. (laughs) That tells you something, how the teams are on the pecking order. Oh, yeah. Uh, And and I should also mention that there was actually some good spots in Philadelphia that we ended up going to. I was actually staying in the Winham Hotel, which is right on Dark Street in Philadelphia, and I was literally across the street from Benjamin Franklin's tomb, like his tombstone. And I flipped a penny in there. And if it lands on heads, that's considered good luck. And mm-hmm. then, of course, I went to Betsy Ross's house. I went to the Liberty Bell, Independence Hall, uh, Congressional Hall, uh, Rocky Balboa. I always wanted to do the thing at the steps yeah. from the movie Rocky. So I got a chance to do that. Uh, we also went to the Eastern State Penitentiary, which for those of you who don't know, uh, Al Capone because my wife took has a degree in criminal justice, Al Capone was a notorious mobster, and most people know who he is. Mm-hmm. He's the most famous prisoner 
or inmate in that penitentiary and he was incarcerated there and he died there. And of all of the inmates, he had the most fanciest cell in that in that facility. Like it's not even an exaggeration. But outside of the Eagles game, though, firsthand, outside of that, the people there were very nice. They were willing to give you directions. They were willing to point out what's the best place to go for food and whatever. Uh, we were also told that Gino's, you know, cheesesteaks and Tony Luke's were tourist traps. That's what we were told. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, hey, good stuff to know. Good stuff to know. Absolutely. But, yeah. And of course, uh, once Road to 32 comes out, we'll definitely have that up on the page as well. And certainly feel free to watch it. it it's it's always a, a good documentary of um, of the different trips that, that um, all of us have been a part of it at one point or another. Obviously, if you haven't seen the Cincinnati one yet, definitely check that out as well. Uh, I, that was like an hour and a half long <laughs> from when we yeah, did that. that but, it took me a while. Yeah. But no, it's all good stuff. And, and, it's, and it's nice because you kind of get to see from a fan point of view some of the different things and you get to you know experience like what it's like at a big game so so it, it's great to see like what some of these different cities do and then of course um as we get into next year like january february we'll be able to finally give some info on uh what we're looking for for next season once the schedule comes out obviously so yeah so, definitely course, yeah so we'll definitely continue on on that and and actually I, i'm planning to at least go on one game next year and then then of course Road to 32 continues because you're up in my neck of the woods in a couple of weeks. So yeah, I'm yeah. going to be in Buffalo. I'm going to be coming to Buffalo, New York in a few weeks for the Bill Cowboys game. But I did want to share with you guys some stuff I brought home from the Eagles game, if you don't mind, because that's why the background is missing. So what I want to show off, I have four items I want to share with you. So the first item I got is right here. I have a limited edition Kelly Green Philadelphia Eagles bottle, and it has the classic 80s Eagles logo right there. And on the top, it well, actually, it's on the bottom. It actually says right there. It says limited edition Kelly Green Bottles, the official beer sponsor of the Philadelphia Eagles. Now, I don't drink Bud Light, but I bought the bottle just for the bottle. Forget the drink. I wanted the bottle. And I actually got a Bud Light bottle last year when we went to Kansas City and did the tour in St. Louis. So Mm -hmm. there you have it. So this is the limited edition Kelly Green Philadelphia Eagles bottle. And you can see it's literally just... Kelly green and yep. a lot of people went queer for this color because obviously that's what the Eagles wore that week. So that's that. And speaking of Kelly green, as I have a lot of Kelly green to show off, I also have a souvenir cup and it's just green and it has the Pepsi logo on it. And it has the classic Eagles logo in Kelly green. And uh, there you have it. And then I have another cup, but I stole this one after the Eagles game and one of the seats so it was available. It was wrapped in plastic wrap, but I grabbed it and it says Pepsi again, but this one is different. So it has the Eagles and the Midnight Green jerseys. So the people on here are Devontae Smith, Jalen Hurts, Brandon Graham, Darius Slay Jr., A.J. Brown, and Lane Johnson. So I got that. And then the last one, I got one in Cincinnati, but I forgot to show that one off. So I'm going to do this one here for the Eagles and check this out. It's a Kelly Green Eagles rally towel. Ah, the old school. Old, yeah. Dude, I'm telling you, they the whole entire city of Philadelphia went queer for this color. This is the equivalent to what the Sabres did when people first found out about the goat head coming back. So mm-hmm. picture that mindset, but twice as large. So this is exactly what people did. Good so stuff. they brought in the... Uh, Kelly Green, there was a Kelly Green billboard for Bud Light, Kelly Green billboards for advertisements for the game. They treated that color and that jersey in that game like as if it was an advertisement for a show on Broadway. Like that's how legit people go nuts for in Philadelphia for the Eagles. It's insane. Nice. Good stuff. Yeah. So, uh, of course, you know, it'll be definitely interesting to check that out once uh, you have it up. So, uh, so of course, once we do, we'll let you know and, uh, you know, we'll definitely have some some fun watching with that. And actually, one thing I will show is I am going to take one more run at this. So now that the Sabres have a new chief operations officer, at least for the interim. This is getting submitted again. And what exactly is it for those who are on Spotify? That will be the scoreboard proposal that the other guy was fired before he could even look at it. But 
what I did, and you can see this on the key bank Reno on the key bank renovation page that we have um, throughout our site as well, but it's a version I worked with uh, Ryan Donald on who, uh, well, Ryan Donald, he um, has drive design and he actually has his own site as well. So we can always put the link up as well, but this is actually um, me and him. It was a collaboration. He did the overall design. I did a lot of the technical specs. So we combined together. Basically it's a 4k capable scoreboard. It roughly main screen is about 22 by 44 and we'll take another run at it, see what happens. So that is going to get mailed out by the end of the week. And uh, God willing, if you see a scoreboard design, that's uh, very much like that in the next season, since the Sabres are going to do that, then you know where it came from. Without a doubt, but just generally from experience, um, Philadelphia was one that I was not going into without a third ringer. We almost got you to come on the trip, but you didn't have any time available for you. Yeah, that was a, the downside with that too, because I was out of vacation time. I was actually in the negative hours. <laughs> so, so that's not the case now, but uh, I got some time back, but yeah, that, that would have been, it would have been fun. Maybe at some point we will, but, but on the flip side, yeah, get to live in my house or <laughs> my, uh, airbnb i'm running out for a few days while you're up here so yeah but i will say this i personally think that if you had the time i would have said without a doubt you would have really liked philadelphia because that's kind of your city that you know it's big blue collar and the people there are generous outside of football but they also make really good cheesesteak but the one place i recommend that we actually there's actually two i recommend and i'm actually wearing the shirt for it as uh, as a souvenir is from a place called Chickies and Pete's and Chickies and Pete's is the equivalent to Buffalo Wild Wings, but it, it sells crab legs and crab fries, which is have like seasoning on it. It's really good. We actually went there twice. We went there on Saturday, you know, for dinner. And then the second time was after the Eagles game because we were trying to get out of the rain. And I ended up grabbing a shirt on Saturday for Chickies and Pete's and it has the Eagles logo on it. So on the bottom, it says Philadelphia football, and it's a black T-shirt. Yeah. So if you're interested in buying the shirt, you can go online at chickiesandpeats.com, and you can literally buy the shirt there. And they had, like, different variants. But I really liked the one with the Kelly Green logo on it. So, they, And I'm not an Eagles fan, for those who want to know. I, it has nothing to do with it. But um, I wanted to share this with you guys because I was going to go into tonight wearing the shirt. Very cool. Very cool. So, yeah, with that being said, you know, that's the end of another episode and uh, we only have a few left before um before Christmas here. So so typically the the week between Christmas and New Year's, we usually take the week off just to celebrate with family and all that. So really, we're down to only literally three episodes left before that. So, so yeah, we're getting there. But at the same time, obviously, if anything breaks during the week, of course, stay tuned to our page. And also, if you want to check us out on the go, go to Spotify.com and uh, Buffalo After Dark is on there. We usually get the episodes up within within a day or two of uh, when we um, do it live here on Facebook first. Of course, check out our YouTube channel. And of course, uh, we're testing out some new looks. So, uh, yeah, we actually have a rundown feature now, which is pretty cool. So now you get to see what we're actually talking about and what's coming up. Yeah. So And um, ESPN route. And of course, and Tom just mentioned it a few minutes ago, be sure to check out or be on the lookout for the newest episode of Road to 32 from my adventures in Philadelphia and a date with the Eagles. Absolutely. So with that, it's another night. We want to say thanks to everyone who um, ended up uh, watching the show tonight. And of course, everyone who joins us trainer, good to hear from you. And with that being said, in the meantime, take care of yourselves and each other, and we will see you next week.